So um, I'm going to talk a bit about predictive modeling and predictive modeling um, with uh, aperiodic sources. So predictive modeling, again, is one of these things that, you know, if we look at time series, we've been doing it for a long time in astronomy. We've, you know, looked up at the sky and we see these things go, go off and it took us well until about here to realize that these are all the same thing and it just turns up every 76 years and is maybe associated with terrible events in the world or maybe not depending on your point of view. But the idea is that, you know, um, we have been sort of from here on out, we did start thinking about things that were going on in the sky and um, particularly seem, things that seem to repeat or see, things that seem to have um, characteristic behaviors. Um, and, um, you know, eventually we sort of figured out that they're not all the same thing and um, broke them down into this sort of um, taxonomy. Um, and they've got different waveforms. But, you know, most of these are periodic. That, you know, they've got some sort of period. I mean, they may be vaguely quasi-periodic, but most of the stuff that we study, most of the stuff that we model, most of the stuff that we characterize is periodic. And so you throw Lomsgargill or you throw conditional entropy or you throw something you know, more sophisticated at these to try and identify these numbers. And I talked about this on, on, on Monday. Um, now, within this taxonomy, there are a couple of aperiodic sources. Um, there are single red giants here. There are uh, irregular red giants over here. And there are AGN over here. And the, uh, the curious thing is that if you actually look at the number of sources in each of those categories, you'll find that that's where the bulk of astrophysical sources lie. Most astrophysical sources are irregular um, in the sense of being aperiodic um, rather than periodic. And yet most of our classification work, most of the, the stuff that we've done to try and model these or, or, or understand them has been based on the stuff that is, you know, now, one reason is because it's much easier to work with periodic sources than non-periodic sources. But typically, um, you know, we can categorize them in terms of some sort of physics, at least. Um, accretion systems are probably the biggest class of aperiodic sources. And we know that we see those in, you know, compact stellar sources to, to supermassive black hole binaries, so right across the full range of scale. Um, young stellar objects, planetary disks, uh, relevant for galaxy formation as well. So these, these things are actually quite important for a lot of our knowledge. Um, you can see it in chromospheric activity. Anything typically where you start having magnetic fields, you may start seeing more aperiodic behavior than periodic behavior. Weird things like Boagian star, so the discussions this morning about outlier detectors and, and that sort of thing, you know, this is maybe what we're looking for. These things where maybe it's exocomets or maybe it's alien artifacts which are orbiting these stars, half-constructed Dyson spheres, that sort of thing, and stellar associations as well. Um, now, I, I would argue that the challenge, you know, I, I'm the project scientist for ZTF, um, and, um, you know, I'm interested in the things that are unexpected. And if something is periodic and regular, it's quite easy, or relatively simple, straightforward, to understand when that behavior begins to be unexpected, and then it becomes an interesting source. The challenge for these sorts of things is that to identify those things, you know, when is the behavior unexpected for an aperiodic source? When is the, the, the variation it's showing different from what you would expect for that type of thing? Um, for example, when it might start showing periodicity. Um, but, um, and can we characterize between different processes that are, are, are linked to that sort of, the, the, the physics that's going on that, that we can, can, can work with? Um, so let's start off thinking by actually what we mean by aperiodicity. Um, can we actually quantify in a, in a meaningful way um, what, you know, the degree of periodicity or the degree of aperiodicity that we see in a, in a particular source, um, which could be useful for some sort of characterization. So um, if you do harmonic analysis, um, then what you're probably doing is you're projecting some sort of function onto a periodic basis, um, and that's fine if you've got an infinitely sampled 
function. So if you look at, you think you've got a sine function or, or something similar, uh, you can you know, project it onto a, a Fourier series basis set or something like that. Um, but it becomes problematic when we have finite sampling because the coefficients of that, that projection become um, very difficult to estimate. Um, now, uh, there's this work by uh, Nicholas Durand. Um, and these are the group who came up with the GPI Python module for doing Gaussian processes. Um, they showed that uh, with a Gaussian process, particularly with something like a Matern kernel, uh, what you can do is you can uh, uh, project this in, in a, a theoretical way onto um, subspaces um, such that the, the, the kernel that you're using for your Gaussian processes um, is a linear combination of a periodic kernel and an aperiodic kernel. So what you're actually doing is that you can decompose a given Gaussian process into the aperiodic component and the periodic component. And here's an example. Here's a Matern kernel, uh, straightforward Matern kernel. You've got slightly different shapes depending on what parameter you're doing. And by doing this projection, you can identify a periodic component within that and then an aperiodic component within that as well. Um, and if you do a sensitivity analysis, then um, randomly sample data points on the input space and, and look at the, the variance once they predict the values through either of those two subkernels and the ratio of the variance between them, you can uh, get some idea of what the, the total, uh, in, in terms here of periodicity, uh, what the, t the total um, contribution from that periodic kernel is over the total kernel. And that gives you a quantifiable way of identifying what periodicity or aperiodicity is in a source. So here we have two AGN. Um, you can see that the matern kernel, the, the parent kernel, the super kernel, gives a very nice fit to both types of behavior. And then we can decompose it into the periodic component here and the aperiodic component here. And you see, obviously, there's, the, you know, you get both. What you probably can't see is the numbers here um, so well. Um, this is a very periodic source. This is a very aperiodic source in the sense that the, the, the contribution of the periodic kernel is very high in this source, and this is very low in this source. So you know there may be an, an, an indicative of that there's a deterministic process which is being modulated by some stochastic noise there. Um, and, and so it gives us something interesting we can do with that. Um, in fact, quasars are really the quintessential period, aperiodic population. Um, we've known that they've been variable since um, forever, um, since the first discovery, you know, 3C48, 1963, Sundaj and Matthews. The paper says one of the most striking features is that the optical radiation varied. Um, but we still don't know what the physical origin of this, this photometric variability is in the optical or the, the UV, whether it's instability in the accretion disk, whether it's uh, stellar eruptions going on, microlensing, all sorts of things. Um, so being able to, to sort of begin to model these may give us some insights into what's, what's going on. Um, and there's a lot of them everywhere you look on the sky, except probably the galactic plane. You'll find AGN in your field of view, um, hundreds of thousands of them. Um, they're not a rare population by any stretch, and so that, that's good for doing systematic studies and, and that sort of thing. Um, but what you find, um, this is some of the work we've done in the last couple of years at the Catalina Sky Survey, is that even in that population, you see things that stand out with some sort of form of outlier anomaly detection. So whether it's flaring activity or microlensing, which is giving you these sort of significant flares, um, on a seemingly otherwise quiet burbling along variability, or whether it's changing look or changing state quasars where they seem to have these um, long-term behaviors which are sort of slow and coherent, either going down or going up, and are, are related to spectroscopically as well. You'll see uh, um, emission line changes in there. There is behavior that you can, by eye, get some idea that this is unexpected. Um, and is it random? So, you know, the, broad, the broader question then is of the type of variability we're seeing with, with quasars in particular, um, is it deterministic in some way or, or is it um, really stochastic in the sense that there's, you know, it's such a large number of degrees of freedom which are coming from an ensemble of very small 
localized processes that is essentially can be modeled as a stochastic perturbation. Uh, or they're just highly nonlinear. Are we, are we seeing some form of turbulence or sums of turbulent activity in the, in the accretion disk that we can maybe characterize or detect in some way? So um, there's a long, well, relatively long history in trying to model quasar variability or to, to describe it uh, statistically. Uh, I mean, the, the simplest form is you just say, well, the magnitude is going to be greater than some, some limit on, on, on size x, and you do that by taking DPOS from you know, the 1980s or 1970s data and comparing it to Sloan 30 years later and Panstars 10 years later and going, well, we can say that quasars vary by a few tenths of a magnitude over a few years. And you go, well, that's, that's really useful. I can use that to maybe find those really extreme ones, but nothing more meaningful. Maybe I can look at excess variability, not really. Structure function gives me some information, not much really. Problems with the um, descriptors and the estimators in the literature. Um, so this is, we come to the damped random walk, which I sort of talked about a bit on Monday. Um, so this is a first order continuous autoregressive model, uh, also known as an ornstein uhlenbeck process, um, known in physics from about the 30s, characterized by this, uh, this uh, stochastic differential equation. Um, the important thing is that you can characterize the variability in terms of two, two parameters that come out of this, which is the variability amplitude and the time scale variability. And if you plot one against the other um, for a, a load of uh, astrophysical sources, you'll find that quasars occupy a particular region, and you can use that as a, as a method of identifying AGN through variability. But it's the basis for all the stochastic models of variability that we see with quasars. Um, people have noted deviations from this model. It's, um, it's a statistical model. People have tried to understand what the, the, if there's a physical connection. Um, unfortunately, it has a lot of problems. And even the values that you estimate from a lot of the, the techniques in the literature are wrong. Um, it's been shown that you actually need 10 times the sampling baseline to actually recover this characteristic time scale. So if your source is at a redshift of 1 and it's got a 300-day characteristic time scale, you need 6,000 days in the observed frame worth of data to be able to actually recover that properly. And so you underestimate uh, typically with a lot of analysis. And that's caused problems because people have tried to tie those parameter values into physical characteristics then. So can we improve on that? Well, damped random walk, as I said, is, this, is a first order continuous, which is, and then there's this whole superset of families of these autoregressive models, um, karma to karima to karfema, um, all continuous time so that they can model the irregular sampling, um, time sampling that we have in most of our data. Um, be nice if I could do this with a Gaussian process. I like Gaussian processes. They're, they're optimal in some ways. They're nice and Bayesian, et cetera, et cetera. Everything can be described by the kernel function, but the problem you have for the, so there's a, a well-defined kernel, as I showed on Monday, for the damped random walk, but there's no closed form kernel for the super parent models. Um, and they get, they get quite nasty quite quickly. Um, however, there are alternative models out there which are sort of equivalent mathematically in terms of what they're trying to describe. And one is the Cauchy class model, um, so these CAR-FEMA models, these very high order or super uh, family models, they, they, they break the modeling down into uh, local roughness, which is um, some characterization of fractal dimension of behavior, and a sort of long, slow range dependence, um, in, which is sort of the moving average term in, in, in the CAR-FEMA. And so there's this, there's this particular form, nice, relatively simple, four-parameter form, three-parameter form for the um, kernel function, which you can use. And what you'll see here is that this is a quasar of, this is the damped random walk fit for it, and this is the Cauchy class fit for it. And certainly by eye, you'll see that this, this looks equivalent. Um, and numerically, they are also equivalent as well. So this is a much broader family, more meaningful model than necessarily the car model. So maybe we can describe these better through this sort of process, through this sort of model. Um, another approach is, well, let's say that we actually believe that it is nonlinear physics we've got going on instead of something stochastic. And um, there are techniques that have been used for financial time series and also for climate science. 
um, for modeling and, and for doing sun forecasting, where um, I can take a strip of my time series and I can estimate a local measure of chaos, something like the Lyapunov exponent, and then I can make predictions going forward and I can understand or say, well, which of those predictions gives me continuity or maintains local smoothness in that local measure of chaos, um, and then I can iterate on that to predict. And so what we have here is this is a quasar time series which has been using that data then to model, and so the red is you do successive point modeling, uh, successive point forecasting, and you see, you know, in this case, it's not too dissimilar from what the, um, what the actual data does realistically. I mean, it goes a bit crazy after some more data points, um, but that's sort of, um, that's probably three, four hundred days worth of data there because of our sampling. Um, <clears throat> But what about deep learning? Is there something we can do with, with um, deep learning and irregular um, for, for, for time series? Um, obviously, this being astroinformatics, we all know that they're trendy, they're good for funding proposals. Um, you put the word deep learning in, you hope it's going to make you more attractive to the people because people see that, as, as Bruce was saying, you see all the, the news articles involving this and people go, ah, it's nice and current. CNNs are good for images. Um, can we do something with CNNs and time series? Um, well, Sheesh has done some work on this with the DMDT mechanism, so you can convert your time series into um, some form of, of, of two by two image, um, sort of two dimensional image, and um, um, then put that through a CNN, and he's had some success on, on certainly doing classification that way. Um, maybe well, there are these neural nets which have memory, um, RNNs, that sort of thing. Um, maybe what I could do actually for the CNN is form some sort of time series, have a sliding window across, and then I would have a sequence of, uh, of images which I could then put through a CNN or whatever. But as I say, there are these networks which are actually sort of explicitly designed for sequences or sequence-to-sequence -sequence modeling. Um, and so what we've been doing is we've been sort of uh, Brett Nall did the original paper in 2017 on periodic stars, regularly sampled, well, irregularly sampled, but not so irregularly. Uh, so we've been applying these to AGN now. So this is our, our uh, RNN autoencoder, um, and we feed in the delta T as, as a feature to handle the irregular sampling. We also introduce it into the uh, hidden layer as an auxiliary. Um, and what we're doing is we take the first 160 points in our light curve uh, um, as input, and we're trying to forecast the, the final 20. So we're, we're taking that, and then we're saying make a prediction on that, because that's the bit we're interested in um, ultimately. Um, and we, one of the things we found as well is um, we uh, looked at um, our data set that we were putting in, and we divided it up into ones where there's clearly just accretion disk activity and no host galaxy activity, because it's the accretion disk activity that we're ultimately interested in modeling. Um, so we've trained on 12,000 quasars, and we use this 20 forecast equi is equivalent to about 500 days. We've played around with some of the parameters as well, whether actually it's just delta T and mag, what happens if we put the, the velocity and acceleration of the mag in there as well? It doesn't make a big difference. It doesn't really seem to. Um, so what do we find? Well, so we train on the, the shaded bit. The, the, the um, unshaded bit is the predicted. Um, this is validation data. And these are um, theoretical models, I think. That's right. So, you know, prediction. We can model really well. The, the quasar stuff, and it looks as though we are, you know, reasonably good at getting close to what the predicted behavior will be as well. Um, in fact, when we compare what the RNN does against what the, uh, the damped random walk model does, we find that the RNN, the autoencoder, does better than the damped random walk model. So we get a better fit to the real data by modeling it with an RNN autoencoder than we do with, you know, putting a damp random walk through it. Well, that's good because we know the damp random walk model has problems. But it's even better than that. If we simulate a damp random walk model and then try and recover the parameters, and we also apply the RNN autoencoder to those simulated damp random walks, 
We do better with the RNL autoencoder on the simulated random rat walk model um, than we do with the standard ways of, ret of retrieving the simulated data. And it's again because these standard techniques underestimate. So there's obviously nonlinear information in the lie curve that the RNN is better at picking up than just the sort of standard modeling. Because this is an autoencoder we're looking at, we've done PCA, so we have 16, we go down to 16 nodes in the hidden layer. Um, and then we do PCA on, the, uh, um, uh, on, on those features just to see what it looks like. And you, so each point here relates to the point over here. And you can see that you know, there's nothing obvious that we're picking up in terms of features, but we're, we're obviously picking up things that are going up and things that are going down and things that are sort of in between. Um, what we can do, however, is we can uh, deconvolve those 16 into a single and then see how that correlates with physical parameters to see if we're actually picking up information related to things we can measure. And what we see is, yes, that autoencoder feature does seem to correlate with, uh, but with luminosity. Um, and when we look at um, where the autoencoder feature is compared to those, the sigma tau that you measure from the damp random walk, we find that um, it's actually, uh, it does as good um, in terms of correlation um, as, as you know, sort of the variance or some of those other features. So there's meaningful information in this stuff that we can extract. So there's, it's good for the modeling. One of the more interesting things is that if you take a regular time series and you either invert it in time or you invert it in magnitude, we were curious about what would happen. Um, the damped random walk itself is, is time invariant because you take the mod of the, uh, uh, of the time differences. Um, so uh, here's the quasar real data light curve. So there's the original. So this is the accuracy. Um, it's an accuracy measure for prediction. And what we find is that we do, there seems to be some effect with the time inverted, that the time inverted light curve gives a different result, whether it's forward or backwards, um, than the simulated. So this is coming from Dan Random Walk, simulated data. It shows the same, it shows time invariance, it shows time symmetry, whereas the real data seems to show time asymmetry. And what we found is the magnitude of this asymmetry that we're seeing from the RNN autoencoder uh, description is correlated with luminosity or, or black hole mass. Um, it's, it's difficult to, distinct, to disentangle the effect of both. But this prediction of asymmetry in the, in, the, in the time series is consistent with certain models of the accretion disk. So it's nice that our models are be actually beginning to capture things that are, are, are realistic that are important for this sort of thing. Now, the ultimate goal of this is this is you know, ZTF uh, discovery image, reference image. You take away the two, and there's your transient. And, and that's great, it's a five sigma detection, and if you're down at 15th magnitude, that's a, a 0.1 magnitude absolute difference. But if you're up in 19th, 20th magnitude, you're looking at a 0 0.7, 0 0.6 magnitude difference. This is some sort of flaring activity, this is a changing look quasar. The, uh, the delta mag that that's equivalent to uh, when I make my change means I'd be 1,500 days into this process before I'd actually detect it through this method. Would be much nicer if I had some nice predictive model which would allow me to capture the proper behavior of the quasar and then when I see that the quasar starts to vary differently from nightly monitoring from my predicted model um, I can get onto it quicker. So this is where we sort of currently are. Um, so as I say ZTF is, is observing the sky every night. We're getting lots of data. Uh, we have our models in place now. Um, and so this is, um, this is an archival model, um, an archival prediction that we were using just to test. So, you know, we've again trained on, on, on this much data and then we made a prediction here and the real object went up here. So this would be picked up by our source, by our, our algorithm as something to do some interesting follow-up on. And the other th the thing to note is that we would actually detect it as being significant maybe two or three hundred days into the behavior, and this is 18th magnitude, at 18th magnitude it would have to be up here, over here, which is maybe 1500 days into the behavior before we would actually get it through the regular transient. So um, this is what we're beginning to do follow up with, 
we have a list of potential candidates. We're now looking at those spectroscopically to, to see if they're interesting or not. Um, so, in summary, um, aperiodic sources form the majority of the astrophysical population, but they remain the lesser studied. Um, aperiodicity can be quantified, so you can actually identify um, a, a set of objects which you might believe are really aperiodic and, and see how well those can be modeled. Um, you can model quasars through a variety of processes, I think far more, far better than the damned random walk, um, which may further work in those will tell us which, you know, maybe we can determine, distinguish between stochastic and, and deterministic behaviors. RNN autoencoders certainly are providing a better model. Um, there are features that are coming from that with, which correlate with physical parameters, so these are good models. And the arrow of time is detectable in our time series as well through the modeling, which has never been the case before. Uh, and forecasting seems tractable. It's, it looks as though we can certainly model out maybe three to 500 days, uh, which for, for the survey sort of doing nightly work or even seasonal work is probably good enough to identify things which might be interesting compared to observations that you're doing. Um, obviously, there's a, you know, there's a whole slew of, of more advanced architectures or, or you know, symmetry or asymmetry aware networks that it might be interesting to, to play around with where you're already enforcing sort of some physically motivated uh, constraints into them and different ways of uh, you know, handling this irregular sampling, which I still worry about. That delta T in the RNN, I think, is not the best way of, 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 of doing the modeling, but something like neural differential equations, where you, you know, you, which handle continuous time might be. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs>